Malik Kelan has worked as a journalist for over 25 years and currently writes for the Wall Street Journal about culture. His work has been published widely in the US and the UK, including in The Village Voice, Vogue, The New York Times, New York Magazine, The Times of London, The Spectator, Spy, and Forbes. His reporting adventures include scuba diving for bodies with the NYPD, searching for Inca treasure in the Ecuadorian mountains, and investigating the murder of a fellow journalist in Pakistan. Welcome to the stage, please, Malik. We also have with us uh, Jean-Victor uh, Encolo, uh, who's a senior program officer in the Coordination, Advocacy, and Program Development Unit of the UN Office of the Special Advisor on Africa. He's been an international civil servant for 20 years with special expertise in public information and the media. His prominent roles include being spokesperson for the presidents of the 64th and 65th session of the General Assembly, serving in 10 UN peacekeeping operations in Africa, and acting as head of office in Kosovo. Before joining the UN, Jean-Victor was a journalist who worked for Radio Canada International and the BBC World Service, among others. Please, Jean-Victor. And of course, we have with us Alan Bushman, who is the artist, artistic director of the Culture Project. And much more. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, um, we just heard an excerpt from Harold Pinter's uh, Nobel uh, Prize for Literature, uh, which he was not able to give in Stockholm itself because he was very ill and, and died shortly thereafter. Now, he goes on to say um, a lot about the relationship between politics and culture, and in particular, how each relate to the question of truth. And one of the, the things that he does in the speech is uh, recite a poem, uh, which has always been one of my personal favorites, uh, by Pablo Neruda. So if you'll permit me, I'm going to read that poem in his stead, because I think it'll set the right tone uh, for the conversation we're going to have. Uh, the poem by Pablo Neruda, written in the wake of the Spanish Civil War, is called, I'm Explaining a Few Things. And one morning, all that was burning. One morning, the bonfires leapt out of the earth, devouring human beings, and from then on, fire. Gunpowder from then on, and from then on, blood. Bandits with planes and moors, bandits with finger rings and duchesses, bandits with black friars, spattering blessings, came through the sky to kill children. And the blood of children ran through the streets without fuss, like children's blood. Jackals that the jackals would despise, stones that the dry thistle would bite on and spit out, vipers that the vipers would abominate. Face to face with you, I have seen the blood of Spain tower like a tide to drown you in one wave of pride and knives. Treacherous generals, see my dead house. Look at broken Spain. From every house, burning metal flows instead of flowers. From every socket of Spain, Spain emerges. And from every dead child, a rifle with eyes. And from every crime, bullets are born, which will one day find the bullseye of your hearts. And you will ask, why doesn't his poetry speak of dreams and leaves and the great volcanoes of his native land? Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. That's uh, Pablo Neruda. I'm explaining a few things, writing in the wake of the Spanish Civil War about the consequences of war uh, and bombardment of civilian populations. So with that, um, I'd like to begin with uh, Malik Kailan, uh, who writes about culture uh, for the Wall Street Journal, uh, to say a few words about what the significance of culture is and what role culture can play, whether it's poetry or art or film, uh, in politics. Thank you, Nermeen. Um, it's interesting listening to that because in some ways it's actually a question directed ex at precisely what I wanted to talk about, which is that he's, um, Neruda is, is actually faced with this question, why doesn't he write about beautiful things? And he says, well, you know, look at what the reality is. Um, why would I do that when I'm faced with this? I would argue that um, you still have a, 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 a duty to keep the beautiful in mind and to keep higher culture in mind, the more barbaric people become, uh, actually as a way to, to counter it. Um, what I should explain to people is that I write about cultures in conflict. Um, 
mostly for the Wall Street Journal. So they send me to places where there are problems. Um, and essentially what I did was I turned a, a, a cultural career into a semi-political one by going to these places and trying to report on things that other people didn't report on. So you'd go and then you'd find that so many people had been killed in a car bomb or in a suicide bomb. or the, And that was what was in the news all the time. And what wasn't in the news was how did human beings deal with each other and with that predicament? How, what did they do to humanize their lives and their communities' lives and so on? And that is, is the definition of culture, after all. So I decided that I was more interested in that aspect of things. And in some ways, that's a, a direct rebuttal to Neruda's point, uh, which is that, yes, I could have gone there and talked about the blood flowing in the streets and, and uh, the spattering of bullets and so on. But actually, there has now been so much of it that it doesn't really penetrate anymore. Uh, what there isn't is an understanding of the individual in a frame that's more human than, the, than that of explosions and bombs and deaths and so on. Uh, the other thing is that when I went to those places, um, in, in particular in Baghdad, I found people asking me, uh, the local people who, you know, the interesting thing about Saddam's uh, rule over those decades, his brutal and bloody rule, is that he paid a lot of attention to culture. And probably that's what undid him in the end. Uh, just as in the end, I suspect that it's what undid the Soviet Union. Uh, there is a, a received opinion, which I support actually, that says that rock and roll destroyed the Soviet Union um, at a time when, of course, it was quite a high-minded undertaking. I don't for a moment believe that it was the amount of money we spent on weapons that they couldn't outspend or even a, a yearning for uh, capitalism and so on. I, I think basically it was that they had successfully and forcibly created a middle class, and the middle class was enlightened and intellectual enough to make a choice against their system. And I think that's probably also what was happening in, in Saddam's time. But what he did was he deliberately, culturally created a middle class. That is something that when uh, the US went in there and forc forcibly to democratize people, it completely didn't consider. The people that I had to deal with that I wrote about the filmmakers, the um, dramatists, and the poets, and so on, kept saying to me, why do you Americans uh, bring us bullets and bombs and politicians and, and above all, religion? That was not a problem that we had before, our religious sectarianism. What, where are your thinkers? Where are your intellectuals? You know, where, w w the Soviet Union used to give us those people. They used to come and talk to us. They used to feel that we were human enough for them to show their human face. And what I've realized over many years of reporting in these conflict zones is that we have this notion that if you give, that politics will liberate you, that money will liberate you, free markets will liberate you, that freedom of religion will liberate you. One thing that we don't have completely given up on is that culture might change everything. We feel about that as we feel about religion, that it's just up to you. We, ha we don't have the right to judge it, but guess what? We have the right to judge your politics. We have the right to judge your economic system. Uh, but we dare not suggest any kind of cultural expansion to you. So that's the thing that I've been concerned with all these years, is to try to tell everybody, actually, probably more than anything, culture matters. Jean-Victor, can you talk about the role of culture and the... Um in all its different forms, in the conflict situations that you've encountered in Africa and elsewhere? Uh, when I was spokesperson for the United Nations, uh, it was easy for me, and I, I tried to do that as best as I could. It was easy for me to answer and all kinds of questions and address all issues. But tonight, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of the United Nations because I'm no longer in that capacity. So I'll be very free. You know, when you're a spokesperson, you, you do your job and you try to do it the best you can. But uh, today, I will be able to speak really as Jean-Victor and Colo uh, and not representing anyone. I would like to suggest the following. Uh, Africa is probably, and I'm not saying it's because I'm African, I think it's 
the most important continent. First, because it's, it's the mother of all battles, the mother of all continents. It is where humankind was born. And uh, today, at the United Nations, at least 70%, or maybe up to 80% of all the work of the Security Council, which is the uh, organ entrusted with international peace and security, at least 70% of the work of that body is uh, dedicated to Africa. Therefore, Africa is very important. So in order to intervene and to do something in Syria, one has to think about the consequences or the lessons learned or the lack of thereof of the previous intervention in Libya. In order to uh, fully understand uh, the pitfalls of international justice, one has to go through the long and sometimes difficult prosecution of Charles Taylor. In order to understand what forgiveness is, one has to go through the whole process of peace and reconciliation in South Africa and apartheid, and what the West did or did not do during apartheid. And I, I quite agree with Malik. Uh, one will not underline enough the role of culture and cultural ambassadors from Paul Simon to Miriam Makeba to Yuma Sekela and so on with regard to uh, the end of apartheid and, and the post-apartheid era. Because Africa has such an importance in the work of the Security Council, it has a place that is not always recognized, however, simply because uh, it is not the place where money goes to. Africa is not that important on the global uh, stage of uh, macroeconomics. It, it is not heavy enough, and, and it is not uh, populated enough, some will believe so. But what I would like to suggest here is that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the actions and the decisions taken by world leaders are impacted by the travails of uh, colonial powers throughout the era of colonization and slavery. And uh, uh, what Africa does with regard to what it can give and what it can take is that it has changed the soul of those who take decisions. I'm going to, to, to explain myself. Uh, 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 most of the conflicts now on the agenda of the Security Council, with the exception of the Middle East and one or two places such as Afghanistan, are in Africa. Most of the peacekeeping operations are in Africa. I, I worked in about 10 peacekeeping operations, one of them being Kosovo. And when I went to Kosovo, I realized that I was able, I was able to understand what was going on exactly because I was prepared. I'm an African, I've worked in African institutions, and when I went to Kosovo, my own cultural preparation uh, and, and awareness just made me understand why somebody in, 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 in prison will, 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 will try to destroy a, a, a neighbor who is not Muslim or vice versa. I believe that because those who are sent to Africa either as adventurers or, or colonialists or soldiers or educators have been uh, so much uh, uh, influenced by what you see in the major scriptures, the Bible, uh, the Holy Quran, and the other holy books that Africa has always been and still is up to this day, unfortunately, a big fantasy. And uh, three uh, important uh, things happened this week, and uh, these events were not mentioned or, or, or taken into consideration enough in, in the West. One is that we just uh, saw the end of the Olympic Games. Everybody spoke about the gold medals, uh, and, and, and everybody spoke about those African athletes who, who tried to, to take refuge in, 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 in England and who ran away from the delegation and who didn't go back home. But nobody spoke about a story uh, that, for me, is critically important. A Somali woman, the only other Somali athlete in the history of Olympics, who wanted to go to London, but who a few days ago or a few weeks ago, was killed uh, as she was trying to reach Italy 
uh, going through Libya and trying to jump on a, on a dinghy canoe uh, on the road to Italy in order to compete on behalf of Somalia. One will, like, one will have to find out why is that this young lady of 22 years old of age who competed in the Olympics game in Beijing was not given a visa, was not supported by a country or by an organization. Why is it that uh, a Somali woman was not able to reach uh, 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 England and, and, comp and compete safely? Now, nobody knows where her body is lying somewhere uh, on a shore or somewhere below uh, uh, the sea. The other story is the death of Meles Zenawi, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. Now, Meles, I, I happen to have uh, uh, come uh, to bump into Meles uh, when I was covering the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1986. At the time, the current president of uh, Eritrea, Isaiah Safaroki, was still a field commander and he was about to take over as Secretary General of the EPLF. And both uh, leaders, uh, Issa Safaroki in, in Eritrea and Mele Zenawi in Ethiopia, uh, really despised each other. And uh, they fought a very, very brutal war from 1998 to 2000. Few years after both countries, uh, uh, Ethiopia came under the TPLF rule and Eritrea became independent. Meles died. But this is extremely important because Africa has lost a very important spokesperson. Uh, they articulate, strong, uh, determined spokesperson. And what is going to happen in Ethiopia is extraordinarily important for the soul and the soul searching of the West when it comes to covering Africa and conflict. Simply because, thanks to Michael Burke of the BBC, uh, you all saw uh, the uh, live aid concert and the whole stream of uh, uh, humanity pouring uh, towards Ethiopia with Bob Geldof and so on, simply because uh, a BBC correspondent used an extraordinary word in wonderful reporting from Ethiopia where you had a line of those who were going to die and a line of those who were going to survive simply because there was not enough food for everybody during the famine and those who were giving food had to choose those who will live and those who will die. And he called it a famine, a crisis of biblical proportions. The third thing that happened is that there is a war in the eastern part of the Congo led by a, a movement called the M23. Now, the M23 is trying to gain territory uh, around the area of Goma and so on. And the accusation is that Rwanda is behind this. And Meles died, and with the Rwandan president, uh, Meles was part of what uh, the Americans and other Western powers call, uh, called the African Renaissance. That was a group of African leaders that were supposed to, 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 to push for the rebirth of Africa. This is dating from, from the, the, the Clinton era. And, 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 and you had something terrible happening a few days ago, uh, which was the killing of miners in, in South Africa by, by white and black policemen which I'm trying just to say that the miscalculation of the West based on cultural affect, which comes back from their own culture and from their own religions and from their own calculations that really go a long way from, from colonization, from slavery, and, and from the myths and, and, and some of the things that you see in, in, in the Bible and so on, in the Quran about black people, about uh, you, you can see the graduation of, of, of people in some of the holy books, the, the blacks are the kafir, uh, the, the very low and so on. And, 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 and some of this, if you take it literally, like some conservatives take literally in this country, uh, which is not different from the Taliban or other places, then you, you, you really get a, a sense of, of what Africa could mean. But if this is turned positively, then things can really change. The problem now is that the countries that were given support and where the West thought that they could have some real progress are these countries where very serious questions are now being asked. And soul searching is only starting. Is South Africa really safe? Uh, are things fine? Why is it that miners will be killed? 
uh, the same thing happened on the apartheid. And, uh, black miners are being killed by black and white police people and so on. So uh, uh, the, 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 the problem here really is that the way all these crises are handled is based, in my opinion, on the fact that there is a cultural uh, uh, error in processing African values and African reality so that people who have the power, who send troops, who send uh, investors, just don't understand what Africa is all about. And, 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 and simply because uh, they also go there on, 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 uh, on the perception that they, uh, their own culture, the culture of, of what is written, a scriptural culture, as opposed to African culture, which is uh, mostly oral culture, they go there on the perception that that culture, their own culture, is superior. And in Africa, when you have a conflict, the injection of uh, cultural rituals in cleansing processes or in, in forgiveness uh, uh, initiatives is extremely important. And some of these rituals are not written. You don't find them in uh, law schools. Uh, you cannot teach them. You cannot learn about them. You have to go through them, live about them. And people will transmit this knowledge from father to son to mother to daughter and so on. And uh, just like uh, uh, in Kosovo, people are still sorting out family disputes based on, uh, on wars and struggles that took place 700 years ago. In Africa, equally, uh, people still rely more on the oral culture that they know. And this is why some Africans, if you ask them, they will complain about uh, the uh, prosecution of Taylor. Not because they like Taylor, but they will say, if you had put Charles Taylor in a process where his punishment and the need for forgiveness or the need for peace and justice has to take into consideration the cultural values that will make him suffer, or you want to remove from Charles Taylor his middle name, which is Nganke, without a middle name in Liberia, without an African middle name, you'll be considered to be a Congo. And you, if you are a Congo, you are therefore somebody who came from one of the ships sent by Madison or Monroe, hence the name of Liberia, the capital of Monrovia, uh, of Liberia, Monrovia, because there is still a lingering war between the Congos, who are the descendants of the, uh, the, the slaves who were freed, who came through the ships that were sent by the Americas between those Congos and the indigenous Liberians in a country that was uh, the, the playing field of Firestone because America had to uh, fuel the industry or the, the car industry and so on, and they needed a lot of rubber. So when you take all that into consideration, the whole cultural importance of what is not written, what you cannot quantify, what you don't see in the Western media, simply because quantification is not qualitative. And you can have uh, something that is richer, that is of more added value, but that may be hidden. Or that may have to be read or heard or listened to f from another perspective. I'm very grateful to Alan Bushman to have uh, helped us bring uh, Salif Keita to the General Assembly Hall. The human rights today are very important. We talk about Syria, we talk about Iraq, we talk about Guantanamo, but one of the first human rights charter is the Kurukan Fuga, which was established in about 1200, around the time Sunjata Keita was creating the empire of Mali. And Sunjata Keita, when he was the emperor, was able to rule from Guinea-Bissau to northern Nigeria in Sokoto. And that was a long time ago. Today, Boko Haram in Nigeria, people in Abuja who are ruling Nigeria, do not have all the means and all the knowledge to stop Boko Haram. Today, northern Mali is under the control of some jihadists. And yet, 700, 800 years ago, Sunjata Keita was able to give an instruction from Bamako or from Segu that will be implemented quickly and without any infringement in Sokoto, in, in today's Nigeria. So one of the things that, um, that, that uh, I wanted to ask about with regards to your uh, 
observations about the middle class, um, the obverse of that, what are we doing by destroying the middle class in this country? Um, if, if, if Saddam get, you know, reinforced and, and, and allowed the middle class to rise, and that was his downfall, is, uh, I don't think there's a direct correlation between our suppression of the middle class now, but w there, there seems to be a relationship. And I wonder if you could speak about that relationship. The other thing, uh, the, because uh, you know, I'm certainly I'm going to forget whatever else. <laughs> <coughs> the other thing that I, that we're that one of the things we wanted to talk about tonight, and and the people that we wanted to talk to them with are both were unavailable, is is drones. And while these are not your areas of expertise, I'm very interested about how the world perceives what we're doing in this unique form of warfare that's becoming so popular, and you know, and and its relationship to. You don't have to speak about its relationships to video games, but it, it, there seems the, the the consequences seem less impactful if someone's sitting in a room with a joystick in Nevada and people are dying in Pakistan and mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So, from from a, a semi uh, educated perspective on this issue, it would be interesting for us to know how you feel and how other people you feel feel about these issues. It's very interesting because I think that. The middle class is a phenomenon that existed for a while. I don't think it's, a, it's something that was always there. I don't think it's necessarily something that will always be there. I think it was a function of a particular phase in history. And it seems to me that it was um, something that was held together by the state in some ways. If you have uh, a completely rampant neoliberal economy, you really are not going to need a middle class. Uh, you're going to have a bunch of people at the top who own a lot of um, things, a lot of industrialists and, and financiers, and you're going to have a lot of people working very, very hard underneath who um, are, are probably going to be a vast, undifferentiated mass of the working class. Um, what the middle class, uh, it would seem to me, was built by um, was education. It's not, it's not really income, uh, I think, that denotes the middle class. I think it's education. And you, if, if the education is a state-sponsored thing, and you simply can't um, have a middle class if you don't have a lot of it. And that's why, uh, paradoxically, it's the countries that are command economy countries that build in their downfall because they are very concentrated on education. And partly they're concentrated on education because they, are, they, need, they have a political message that they have to get out. So education is also part of indoctrination. But it educates people. It makes them enlightened. It makes them expect a certain level of, of humanity and freedom and what have you. And, and ultimately, now, the system that we have uh, increasingly developed and the world has developed, and China in particular is now practically leading that system, is that Human beings are defined by the accidents of the um, economic imperatives of the situation. And, um, and the, the amount of humanity or the amount of knowledge or enlightenment uh, those individuals have uh, really are not a measure of anything and, or anything valuable. Now, I want to say something controversial here in relation to that, which is that our... Um, cherished, prized idea of being inclusive and of, be, uh, and, and of multiculturalism and uh, multi-ethnicity and so on and so on is in some way something also that contributes to this because what happens is that traditions that become totally interchangeable and I've seen it around the world in, in reporting about this um, they lose the frame in which a human being stands. And they lose the ability culturally to fix a person in the grandeur of a certain kind of landscape, whether it's musical or theatrical or poetic or what have you. And I know that we all think from a political point of view that, that it's a great thing, and of course it is, to be accepting of it. but. Never accept, and this is one of the lessons that I've learned, the automatic nostrums 
of economists or political thinkers or even medical thinkers. Something that seems to bind reality in a primary knot from which you can then adduce a hundred other things and which we all make assumptions on. Stop. If you keep hearing the same thing, stop. Reconsider. If you have a, I remember a gay friend telling me that he loved Miami Beach because there was so much diversity there. And I said to him, fine, is there any poetry? Because actually poetry only comes out of a condensed, concentrated, interpenetrated culture that understands its highest concepts. So I urge you all, begin with cultural thought, not political, not economic, not all the other things that they want to feed you with. Put the human being in a cultural frame and then unwind all the cliches that they want to feed you. That's the way to solving a lot of these conflicts around the world that I've had to report on. And I, I think it's also the way to the truth in, in the long run. I agree when you speak about the whole question of multiculturalism, but if, if you just limit your own if I may say, your own analysis to what is happening in this country. Because I believe that the melting pot elsewhere in the world works differently and has different uh, results and consequences. Um, uh, uh, there is no guarantee that mixing people and cultures differently will not provide the same result. Uh, Somalia is a unique case in the world, and I would say starting with Africa. Why? Because the war in Somalia is very brutal and has been very long. And they managed to kick out the Americans because the Americans never thought that the Somali would be so determined, so, so crazy, just like Burton used to write. Somalia is the only country where there is a very serious conflict, but at the same time, it's the only African country where you have one religion, one ethnic group, one language. And the Somali started writing not long ago. Before, you couldn't write the Somali language. Siad Bari tried to push that, uh, the first president of Somalia. And yet, in, in the country that should have the greatest uh, uh, cohesion, in the country where people understand each other, speak the same language, have the same religion, pray to the same God, it is yet the country that is the most divided. In America, I understand what you say and I agree, but only when it comes to the America. Elsewhere, I believe that the, the, the input coming from other cultures, coming from travelers, coming from migrants, have played quite a very positive role. Oh, no, no, I don't dispute uh, that. Uh, uh, I, I don't dispute uh, that. The French. But I think it's the, the I, have... Well, I, I think what you have to guard against, though, is, what, for example, when you, have a, when you have the English language stretched so thin that many, many, many people can communicate in it, um, the, many more than we ever thought, it doesn't mean that the communication is of a higher quality. I agree. So that's my only point. I, I don't say that uh, uni-ethnicity or multi-ethnicity gar guarantees one thing or the other. I just say that culture is something, let's begin with that and take the analysis from there. Because looking at it from the other point of view, which is the, the, the human political animal or the human consumer or the human uh, religious um, identity, all those things I think have not paid off. But the, human, the, the middle class is nothing, including in this country, if that middle class is not led or is not enlightened by enlightened leaders who have courage. Therefore, it is not the middle class that is really, truly important because they will follow the trend and they will follow the super PACs. They will follow the Kony video in order to have their own uh, analysis of what's going on in Uganda. What is important, however, is to see how many leaders, how many enlightened and courageous people, how many Desmond Tutus, how many really critical thinkers a middle class or a country can produce. 
And this is why in a country like France, uh, a minister of culture is extremely important. You don't have a minister of culture in this country. And yet in, in a country like France, the, the, the French involvement in Libya and the bombing of, of, of Tripoli by the British and the French, uh, we now know that Bernard Henri Lévy was very instrumental in taking uh, Sarkozy and the French government to, to take action because he wrote books, he moved people, he went there, and, and, and in the Spanish war, uh, uh, Marcel Camus uh, was very uh, important. I'm talking about the civil war on the Franco and, 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 and the Second World War. I mean, and, and, uh, and as we spoke before, we started this conversation, the French had this very important notion and high uh, appreciation of their own culture and the value of their own intellectuals. And it is true that uh, if you see the way I'm dressed today, it's simply because clearly uh, we were somehow uh, on, the, on the French colony for, for some time after being on the German colony. So there are things that remain into that. And, and, and what is more important rather, it's not for what comes from the countries that are powerful to the countries that are at the receiving end of uh, important geopolitical decisions. It is the interaction. It is what comes back from Iraq, what comes back from Africa, the fact that Salif Keita comes here, the fact that uh, a Somal S Somalia is the greatest place for culture and poetry. If you ask, is there poetry in, in, on a beach in, in, in Florida, I will tell you, <laughs> there is plenty poetry in Somalia. Most Somalis are poets. It's a beautiful language. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful culture. And, 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 and these are people of knowledge. Timbuktu in Mali is also, and we can say, unfortunately, sadly, was also a great place of culture. But the fact that this place was taken over by people who started destroying the heritage of Timbuktu, and nobody moved. Nobody I, moved. I should, can I make a comment on that? I wrote a, an opinion in the Wall Street Journal about that um, because it compares to incidents that happened at the end of the, um, the Balkan War, the Bosnia-Serbia War. Um, in Kosovo and in Bosnia, a lot of Gulf and Saudi money came in to those Muslim communities uh, offering to rebuild their mosques. Uh, but they came in with preconditions. And the preconditions were that the local uh, Muslims had to uh, deface the decorations uh, inside the mosque and also get rid of the sculptural tombstones that they had in, uh, in, in their graveyards, which are uh, 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 a legacy of the Ottoman Empire which had actually that lovely tradition where people uh, who were buried had uh, sculpted headstones that were actually quite attractive. And uh, they had to knock those, you know, break them up and get rid of them and so on. And they were weeping because these were their ancestors, but in, uh, in return for money they had to do it. And these are the same people, or it's the same mentality, which is the mentality of a religionist culture um, and, and of a kind of suspicion of uh, the beautiful or the decorative or um, the, the uh, artistic uh, because it's a form of Islam that comes out of the desert and is iconoclastic and believes in its um, unilateral imperative. And that's the thing that has been exported around the world because it had money behind it. And because the US at a certain point in the 70s saw that the particular kind of uh, warrior virulence that it had was going to be useful in uh, moving against uh, the, the uh, spread of the Soviet influence around the world. And uh, these are the people that overran Mali. And their attitude is that these um, decorative um, structures are offensive to them. I mean, it's a kind of an aesthetic judgment, uh, but it's an aesthetic, and it's, it's the same attitude as the Taliban with the Bamiyan Buddhas. Mm -hmm. um, so I bring you back to uh, the idea that culture is, in all of these things, central, uh, but nobody actually ever talks about it. Now, on Alan's on Alan second question. We're also we're missing the feminine perspective on this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Let him respond yeah. to your question. Okay. Yeah, on, on, on Alan's very important question on the drones. I believe, Alan, with due respect, that even though this is very important and it really touches our hearts to see that somebody may, may be playing with a joystick somewhere and killing somebody uh, 
who is day far away, I believe that there is nothing new there. It has always happened. It's only that it's a new tool, it's the new sword, it's a new technology, and tomorrow something better will be found. In Haiti, on the Duvalier, the Tonton Makut had a way of doing this. And it was worse than the drones, worse than the, the joystick. They had the Makut, and uh, somebody will give instructions. And those instructions will not be written and will say, go and get Alan Bushman and his people out. And they'll come here to Culture Project. And they'll just take you out. And uh, they'll kill you, they'll burn you. They will not even know where the instructions exactly come from. Sometimes they will only believe that they should take you out because it will please somebody, a master. So uh, 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 they have therefore per, uh, 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 perform an art of war where you actually do not see the foot soldiers, you don't see the general, you don't see the line, you only see the consequence. And in addition to taking you out, they will do something in Haitian Creole, which is called deshuke, le deshukage, which means that you do not only kill somebody, you don't only get that person dead, you also have to remove that person from the earth. You have to burn the person, coupe tête et brûler caille. You have to chop off the head, and burn the house. You have to kill the person in such a way that it will have the same impact as the drone is having today, meaning a missile from above just taking out somebody who unsuspectingly is being killed without knowing where the order came from. You cannot trace that. You cannot prosecute anybody. You just don't know where it came from. And I believe that all over the world it has been happening. It has been happening throughout time. It's just that it's a new sword, it's a new gun, it's a new technology. It, it, it will continue to be improved. I worked in Haiti in 1997 as part of a group of experts. Our job was to, to get rid of the Haitian army. There is no army in Haiti today because of that, because uh, we all came to the conclusion that the Haitian army, the, the army in Haiti was more of a threat to their own people than something useful. Now, they are trying to build up a police force. Some people told us that it was a mistake. Maybe it was, maybe it was not. But they were still using the weapons given to them to, to, to defend the country if, there was, if ever there was an attack, and using the methods that looked like the drones at the time. And these methods were based on voodoo, voodoo culture, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, the killing by the drones is something that, of course, uh, can be criticized, can be vilified. But in my opinion, there is nothing new. And as long as you have that, you'll have. Well, I, I, I think they have to disagree because if somebody's <coughs> going to come here to take me out, I might be lucky enough to be able to beat them over the head. But how do you retaliate about somebody that's a thousand, uh, ten thousand miles away, it, and, and there's no recourse? They're, they're not at risk. The person that's sitting in an, in an office in Nevada is not at risk when he's sending out weapons to kill people in another country. That's the difference. There's no engagement in it because there's, there's no retaliations. There's no, drone, there's no drones coming back. Well, they have been uh, worse than the drones. Uh, other weapons that were tried on some people, on individuals, like poisoning or whatever, uh, where people just couldn't see. Where yeah, I mean, long distance, uh, long distance warfare is not anything new. You know, the B-52 is has been with us for some time, that phenomenon. The the atom bomb, uh, when it was used. I don't know that that's the, the distinguishing feature. I think it's, um, I don't, I would agree actually that, I don't know that um, it really brings in anything that new or different um, into the phenomenon of, of killing. Can I actually say something? I mean, I, I agree with, with you, Alan. I mean, the question of drones, there, there are two things. One is that there is the question of accountability. No one is accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the, the drones also in, that go out from this country are operated by the CIA. They're not uh, accountable to any, uh, no elected official will be answerable for what those drones do. I think that is significant. It's also true that right now they're very, I mean, given what is possible, the strikes are quite limited. But there's no reason that that'll remain the case. I mean, they started out, they're in Pakistan, they're in Afghanistan, 
they're in Yemen, and we don't know where else they will go. Uh, and, and the fact that there's no one accountable to them, and the fact that the, the, the scale uh, uh, and what uh, possible devastation they could wreak with absolutely no, no possibility of any damage, any risk uh, to anyone in the US military. At the moment, they are able to duck under the radar because it's small, isolated, you know, specific things, isn't it? But yeah, that's true, but that doesn't, no, that doesn't mean that there aren't civil, civilians who are, who are killed. Yeah, that's number one, and they can always I, say we're sorry, I, it's collateral damage, which is what they've but said. But, they've but let me bring it back to what the, the topic, if you don't mind, um, is the, the question, what, whatever all of us may think of drones, the question is, how often do we hear of drones in the American media? How many people are aware of how many strikes are carried out? how many people who are uh, alleged terrorists are killed, and how many civilians are killed. And is it the responsibility of the media here to inform the citizenry about what is happening in, in effect in their name? And drones are just one example. There, there are several other examples. Jean-Victor, you mentioned um, you know, a lot of news that came out of, uh, of Africa recently. So I'd like to hear more from you about how you think um, you know, some of these things, like the South African miners, for example, who were killed. Uh, how it is that those events ought to be represented um, in the media, and especially the, the death of uh, Zanawi Meles, you mentioned, in Ethiopia. How is it that the US should represent that death, given the fact that he is, as you said, he was an important spokesperson for Africa. He was also an extremely important ally of the US in their war on terror, uh, yes. and in the war that they've waged in, in, in Somalia. So if, if we could see how is it that the media should be representing things here, uh, where the U.S. has a direct role to play uh, and is responsible for concrete things that occur in those contexts. You need a combination of quantity and quality. Uh, there are not enough correspondents, American correspondents who are covering Africa. Already, when I lived in Canada 30 years ago, you only had one Canadian who covered Africa and who was based in Africa on behalf of the entire Canadian media corporations, and that was somebody from the Globe and Mail. Ask yourself, here in the United States, you take the New York Times, you take uh, all the television networks, you take uh, and, uh, all, all the news agencies, how many of them have a resident correspondent in Africa? You have some people in Cairo, some people in, uh, in, in Johannesburg, maybe some people in Dakar, sometimes a few in Nairobi, and that's about it. And they claim to cover a continent of 54 countries, a continent that is more complex than we think and that has recorded a lot of growth in the past years, that has also recorded a lot of disasters, a lot of complex issues. If the succession following Meles' death doesn't go well in Ethiopia, I mean, life aids and Bob Geldof will look like kindergarten party if Ethiopia goes bad, simply because it will have an impact on Somalia, it will have an impact on the Horn of Africa, it will have an impact on a newly uh, uh, independent country, South Sudan and Sudan, it will have an impact all over. So in order for Afri Africa to be well covered, first, but one cannot force that, Western media have to invest and have to have, to have Africa covered well. The best coverage on Africa now comes from Radio France Internationale, with French government interest and control, Agence France Presse, sometimes Reuters, certainly the BBC French Afrique, and, and that's about it. You have some blogs and some online uh, news coverage like allafrica.com, but to truly to send a correspondent to cover a story in Africa is expensive. It may not be rewarding in terms of what it brings, in terms of money, I was the first sub-Saharan African journalist to meet Isaias Afewarki during a war that lasted for more than 30 years between Ethiopia and Eritrea. The first journalist to go and meet him there. And this war has been covered by others. Not only is it the fact that Western media do not cover Africa almost at all. Mm -hmm. They are seated somewhere in Cairo or Joburg or Dakar or Nairobi, and they are told, cover the continent. Okay, can I make a comment on that? Okay, you can comment, and then we have to open it up yeah. to the floor, because we have only yeah, 10 and, minutes. And, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I think that the drone strikes begin before the drones are armed. They begin before the military goes in. Uh, they begin before the war starts. Uh, and the same goes for the coverage of Africa, which is that unless we have a frame within which to perceive the individual or the human being in that other culture, it's very easy um, to kill lots and lots of them and not feel the, the emotional consequence of it. And that too begins with culture, I might add. Um, it's, it, we don't have really a proper way of perceiving about Africa, uh, of, of perceiving a frame uh, for Africa, in, in a picture in which to humanize that perspective, to look at those people and to see uh, them in, in, in a narrative that's, uh, that's ennobling and that we can understand and digest. That too is a cultural issue. That's where it all begins. The drones come later. Go ahead. Please, please, Anna. I have a short answer to that. If Africa was covered better in this country, some of the super PAC and some of the media lies about Barack Obama, who is the son of an African intellectual and of an American white mother, those lies will not have passed. If Africa was covered well, they will know better about Kenya, about Africa. They will put things in perspective. But it is so easy, therefore, to use uh, race and to inject it negatively in the political conversation in this country, simply because people don't know. When you have, wh wherever you have ignorance, many things can be said. And super PAC can be very powerful and efficient. Therefore. It is in the interest of everybody, in the interest of Africans. When I went to school back in Cameroon, I knew more about the world. I learned about Mesopotamia, about Iraq, about Biblos, about Tyr, about Lebanon, about, about America, about, about, about the civil war in this country. I, I suspect those kids going to school here at the same time did not know about Africa, were not thought. And to think that what is being fed to people here, what people have to know about themselves, about Wisconsin, will be sufficient. Those in Wisconsin will start understanding that, I mean, the global village didn't start with Marshall McLuhan. It started long, long ago. You already have some African artifacts in pre-Columbian Latin America. So uh, we are a small village. And, and knowing about each other, in my opinion, is the best ingredient to advert war and violence. Yeah, culture it's begins at home, basically. Mm -hmm. and, it's and that's a very quick point. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's true. There are lots of people um, who aren't interested, but the question is, which comes first? I mean, an audience is not given a priority. An audience is produced. So who makes that audience lack interest in what's happening in Africa or anywhere else? And so then shouldn't the media, and if the media did, and if education was, as, as Jean-Victor was saying, of a different kind, then perhaps apathy wouldn't be as you, as you describe it being. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. Please. Um, in regards to the Security Council, you said is um, talking about Africa a lot. Is it a lot of like, US-China relations? Because I know on the economic scale, China's really pushing into Africa. I will answer that question very honestly, and again, I'm not speaking here on behalf of the UN. 
tomorrow's war, today's battle, is precisely about mineral resources. China, with its hundreds of millions of people, will have to continue to feed their own children. They'll have to have the economy keep on growing, keep on producing. How do they do that? They will need resources. They will need oil. They will need material. They will need all kinds of things. Where do you find that? You all have a mobile phone with you. A few years ago, the mobile phone was something very heavy. Uh, you will charge it, and after two or three hours, it will go down. Today, you can charge your mobile phone and use it for two or three days. Why? Because there is a material in the Congo called the Colton, which now allows information and energy to be stored in mobile phone in a very efficient way. If every Chinese gets a mobile phone in 10 years' time, where is this going to come from? Therefore, Africa has become an important battleground for tomorrow's future. Now, for, for, for the Chinese to do what they are doing, you can say it is in their own interest. But on whose interest? On, on peace is in the interest of whom? Now, can you reach the same result, making sure that all the countries get what they need in terms of energy, welfare, uh, food, and so on, by avoiding peace? It's a philosophical question. But at the end of the day, information, culture, cultural ambassadors, and courageous leaders become extremely meaningful in changing the course of history. Please. Uh, America, as a country, we produce a lot of popular culture, like a lot of music, a lot of movies, and like a lot of art. But why do you think America doesn't have its own culture? Because I feel like I grew up in a country with many different ones. And you can go to school and you learn a little bit, but they don't tell you. I feel like I've never been told enough. And how can America develop its own culture and a culture that's also based on human need? That um, we were actually having a chat here before everything started, and um, I was trying to make a distinction between culture and entertainment. And uh, America puts out a whole lot of entertainment, and uh, it that has drowned out actually its culture. And uh, this very very kind of uh, diaphanous, diffuse uh, definition of what culture is and so on, which is wonderful. It's all inclusive and what have you. But actually, when you're dealing with a bunch of very serious people in the Middle East who are reading the Quran every day and who are dealing with and, and taught from a young age to deal with heavy philosophical questions and so on. And you go in there and you say to them, look, you know, we bring you uh, the message of salvation. Here's democracy. Here's this. Here's that. And they look at you and you say, and here's our culture. And essentially it's entertainment. It's reality shows and it's this and yeah, they, that's that may seem to us to be sufficient as culture. It's not really going to wash around the rest of the world. It'll entertain the rest of the world, but it won't be a dignified um, discourse between us and them. I, I certainly understand and respect that perspective, but when you go into Bed-Stuy and there's a culture that comes out <clears throat> that takes the form of hip-hop, and these people, to many, it seems like entertainment, but to some, it seems like it's a very important part of their actual culture that it has, doesn't have certain kind of sophisticated forms that other members of the US society are accustomed to. But, but the, the subtlety and the, and, the, and, the, and the commitment that these people have made to their art form and to their culture may not be exportable, but it's quite serious. We have to be, in my humble opinion, we have to be careful. What is American culture? What is America? And who makes American culture? Uh, I, I grew up in Cameroon. The only films I could see were Indian cinema. And I could not even understand because there were no subtitles. <laughs> but I loved the music. I loved the gazelles. And I thought the women were extremely beautiful. So this, this formed my imagery. Here in this country, American culture clearly exists. But all these things, I mean, culture 
is like the sea. It's a magma. Water goes to water. We are all part of a very small world. What they call in Brazil, capoeira, is called back home in my country, Zimbabwe. And, 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 and what Alan is talking about, it's, it's just another form of uh, 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 the call and response that you see in African drumming and African dancing that has developed into hip hop here. Rap music actually was born, believe it or not, in Libya. Yes, on the, on the, 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 the Libyan border where people uh, speak specific languages that, that you find in the desert from Mauritania to Mali and so on. So if you take music, why is it that without knowing the reason, I love, I'm, 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 I'm addicted to Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan's music, and yet I don't speak any of those languages. But there is something special there that I find very reassuring and very African, somehow in his music. And they are, I love Steve Miller and the Steve Miller band. And I don't know why. <laughs> and, 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 and that for me, I mean, I flew from New York to, 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 to Oakland and I drove from Oakland to the Sleep Train Pavilion to, 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 to watch a concert by Steve Miller and the Steve Miller band. And I did that. So for, for me, it's, it's quite, and, and why is it that Santana and Mahesh Vishnu, John McLaughlin, put together a wonderful album called Love, Devotion, Surrender. And yet Santana plays African, uh, Latin music of African inspiration. And, and, and with uh, Mahesh Vishnu, with John McLaughlin, it was a very beautiful album. And yet these are very two very, two very different uh, musical uh, uh, inspirations and traditions. So. American culture is actually uh, 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 something that owes a lot to the culture of the slaves and the former slaves and to the Irish culture and so on. And when you listen to Irish music very, very carefully, you see that there is something in there. Trust me. I think that the um, question boils down to how do you distinguish between uh, the old question, which apparently now we feel is is um, sort of irrelevant and beneath us and so on, but how do you distinguish between high culture and low culture, or high culture and entertainment? And, you know, the cultures do mix and they do come from one place and end up in another and uh, it can take millennia and what have you, and that's all interesting, but I'm, I, I was talking with you about the distinction between culture and entertainment and, and it's now fashionable uh, not to see any distinction. But... Um, and, and for people to talk, you know, the Umberto echoes of this world, to talk about how, you know, everything is a text and uh, Shakespeare and reality shows really are, are uh, the same thing and so on. Well, we know they're not. Um, there are many, many cultures still that really know they're not the same thing. And they expect that if we come in there uh, lecturing them about what their economic system should be like, and their political system should be like, and so on, that we at least should have the wisdom to distinguish between the high and the low, uh, so that they, we're dignified enough to be able to teach them anything. So that's the crux of the well, issue. Is, isn't yeah. it the fact that sometimes the very low in other places becomes the very high? You know, you can turn it around. For, for, as the other one was so saying. The, let's say the pornography of one place becomes a Shakespeare of another. Possibly. That, that's an accident. It doesn't... It's, oh, no, I, I wouldn't it's, put it that way. For rap music, for some, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. can be it considered can. a very yeah. hard but, form but of you, art. Let's not allow that to confuse things, though, yeah. which is that there is a form of culture that, that frames the human being in a dignified way um, and, and redeems him and elevates him. There's another form of culture that simply helps him spend time and, and uh, have fun. And, uh, you know, there are many... Societies that are able, um, I mean, the two can exist at the same time. Shakespeare did both, you know, but when you don't have it at all, it's perfectly uh, visible. Well, thank you all very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to conclude now. Um, thank you all for joining us. <laughs>